The Price by Neil Gaiman. Read to you by me, Ariel. I do not own the rights. Tramps and vagabonds have marks they make on gateposts and trees and doors, letting others of their kind know a little about the people who live at the houses and farms they pass on their travels. I think cats must leave similar signs. How else to explain the cats who turn up at our door through the year, hungry, flea-ridden, and abandoned? We take them in, we get rid of the fleas and ticks, feed them, take them to the vet, we pay for them to get their shots, and indignity upon indignity, we have them spayed or neutered. And they stay with us for a few months, or for a year, or forever. Most of them arrive in summer. We live in the country, just the right distance out of town for the city dwellers to abandon their cats near us. We never seem to have more than eight cats, rarely less than three. The cat population of my house is currently as follows. Hermione and Pod, Tabby and Black, respectively, the mad sisters who live in my attic office and do not mingle. Snowflake, the blue-eyed, long-haired white cat who lived wild in the woods for years before she gave up her wild ways for soft sofas and beds. And last, but largest, Furball, Snowflake's cushion-like calicoed long-haired daughter, orange and black and white, whom I discovered as a tiny kitten in our garage one day. Strangled and almost dead, her head poked through an old badminton net, and who surprised us all by not dying, but instead growing up to be the best-natured cat I have ever encountered. And then there is the black cat, who has no other name than the black cat, and who turned up almost a month ago. We did not realize he was going to be living here at first. He looked too well-fed to be astray, too old and jaunty to have been abandoned. He looked like a small panther. He moved like a patch of night. One day, in the summer, he was lurking about our ramshackle porch, eight or nine years old, at a guess, male, greenish-yellow of eye, very friendly, quite unperturbable. I assumed he belonged to a neighboring farmer or household. I went away for a few weeks to finish writing a book, and when I came home he was still on our porch, living in an old cat bed one of the children had found for him. He was, however, almost unrecognizable. Patches of fur had gone, and there were deep scratches on his gray skin. The tip of one ear was chewed away. There was a gash beneath one eye, a slice gone from one lip. He looked tired and thin. We took the black cat to the vet, where we got him some antibiotics, which we fed to him each night, along with some soft cat food. We wondered who he was fighting. Snowflake? Our beautiful, white, near-feral queen? Raccoons? A rat-tailed, fanged possum? Each night, the scratches would be worse. One night, his side would be chewed up. The next, it would be his underbelly, raked with claw marks and bloody to the touch. When it got to that point, I took him down to the basement to recover beside the furnace and the piles of boxes. He was surprisingly heavy, the black cat. As I picked him up and carried him down there with the cat basket and a litter box and some food and water, I closed the door behind me. I had to wash the blood from my hands when I left the basement. He stayed down there for four days. At first, he seemed too weak to feed himself. A cut beneath one eye had rendered him almost one-eyed, and he limped and lolled weakly, Thick yellow pus oozed from the cut on his lip. I went down there every morning and every night, and I fed him and gave him antibiotics, which I mixed with canned food, and I dabbed at the worst of the cuts and spoke to him. He had diarrhea, and although I changed his litter daily, the basement stank evilly. The four days that the black cat lived in the basement were a bad four days in my house. The baby slipped in the bath and banged her head and might have drowned. I learned that the project I had set my heart on, adapting Hope Marley's novel, Lud in the Mist, for the BBC, was no longer going to happen. And I realized that I did not have the energy to begin again from scratch, pitching it to other networks or to other media. My daughter left for summer camp and immediately began to send home a plethora of heart 
tearing letters and cards, five or six each day, imploring us to bring her home. My son had some kind of fight with his best friend to the point that they were no longer on speaking terms. And returning home one night, my wife hit a deer that ran out in front of the car. The deer was killed and the car was left undrivable. And my wife sustained a small cut over one eye. By the fourth day, the cat was prowling the basement, walking haltedly but patiently between the stacks of books and comics, the boxes of mail and cassettes, of pictures and gifts and of stuff. He meowed at me to let him out, and reluctantly, I did so. He went back onto the porch and slept there for the rest of the day. The next morning, there was a deep new gash in his flanks, and clumps of black hair, his, covered the wooden boards of the porch. Letters arrived that day from my daughter, telling us that camp was going better and she thought she could survive a few days. My son and his friends sorted out their problem, although what the argument was about, trading cards, computer games, Star Wars, or a girl, I would never learn. The BBC executive who had voted Lud in the Mist was discovered to have been taking bribes, well, questionable loans, from an independent production company and was sent home on permanent leave. His successor, I was delighted to learn, when she faxed me, was the woman who had initially proposed the project to me before leaving the BBC. I thought about returning the black cat to the basement, but decided against it. Instead, I resolved to try to discover what kind of animal was coming to our house each night, and from there to formulate a plan of action, to trap it, perhaps. For birthdays and at Christmas, my family gives me gadgets and gizmos, pricey toys which excite my fancy, ultimately rarely leave their boxes. There is a food dehydrator, an electric carving knife, a bread-making machine, and last year's present, a pair of see-in-the-dark binoculars. On Christmas Day, I had put the batteries into the binoculars and had walked about the basement in the dark, too impatient to even wait until nightfall, stalking a flock of imaginary starlings. You were warned not to turn them on in the light. That would have damaged the binoculars and quite possibly your eyes as well. Afterward, I had put the device back into its box and it sat there still, in my office, beside the box of computer cables and forgotten bits and pieces. Perhaps, I thought, if the creature, dog or cat or raccoon or what have you, were to see me sitting on the porch, it would not come. So I took a chair into the box and coat room, a little larger than a closet, which overlooked the porch. And when everyone in the house was asleep, I went onto the porch and bid the black cat good night. That cat, my wife had said, when he first arrived, is a person. And there was something very person-like in his huge, leonine face, his broad black nose, his greenish-yellow eyes, his fang but amiable mouth, still leaking amber pus from the right lower lip. I stroked his head and scratched beneath his chin and wished him well. Then I went inside and turned off the light on the porch. I sat on my chair in the darkness inside the house with the sea in the dark binoculars on my lap. I had switched the binoculars on and a trickle of green light came from the eyepieces. Time passed in the darkness. I experimented with looking at the darkness with the binoculars, learning to focus, to see the world in shades of green. I found myself horrified by the number of swarming insects I could see in the night air. It was as if the night world was some kind of nightmarish soup swimming with life. And then I lowered the binoculars from my eyes and stared out at the rich black and blues of the night, empty and peaceful and calm. Time passed. I struggled to keep awake. I found myself profoundly missing cigarettes and coffee, my two last addictions. But before I had tumbled too far into the world of sleep and dreams, a yowl from the garden jerked me fully awake. I fumbled the binoculars to my eyes and was disappointed to see that it was merely Snowflake, the white cat, streaking across the front garden like a patch of greenish-white light. She vanished into the woodland to the left of the house and was gone. I was about to settle myself back down when it occurred to me to wonder exactly what startled Snowflake so 
and I began scanning the middle distance with the binoculars, looking for a huge raccoon, a dog, or a vicious possum. And there was indeed something coming down the driveway toward the house. I could see it through the binoculars, clear as day. It was the devil. I had never seen the devil before, and although I had written about him in the past, if pressed, I would have confessed that I had no belief in him other than an imaginary figure, tragic and Miltonian. The figure coming up the driveway was not Milton's Lucifer. It was the devil. My heart began to pound in my chest, to pound so hard that it hurt. I hoped it could not see me, that in that dark house behind the glass window, I was hidden. The figure flickered and changed as it walked up the drive. One moment it was a dark, bull-like, minotaurish. The next it was slim and female, and the next it was a cat itself. A scarred, huge, green-eyed wildcat with a face contorted with hate. There are steps that lead up to my porch. Four white wooden steps in need of a coat of paint. I knew they were white, although they were, like everything else, green through my binoculars. At the bottom step, the devil stopped and called out something that I could not understand. Three, perhaps four words in whining, howling language that must have been old and forgotten when Babylon was young. Although I did not understand the words, I could feel the hairs rise on the back of my neck as it called. And then I heard, muffled through the glass but still audible, a low growl, a challenge. And slowly, unsteadily, a black figure walked down the steps of the house, away from me, toward the devil. These days, the black cat no longer moved like a panther. Instead, he stumbled and rocked, like a sailor only recently returned to land. The devil was a woman now. She said something soothing and gentle to the cat, in a tongue that sounded like French, and reached out a hand to him. He sank his teeth into her arm, and her lip curled, and she spat at him. The woman glanced up at me then, and if I had doubt that she was the devil before, I was certain of it now. The woman's eyes flash red fire at me, but you can see no red through the night vision binoculars, only shades of green, and the devil saw me through the window. It saw me. I am in no doubt about that at all. The devil twisted and writhed, and now was some kind of jackal, a flat-faced, huge-headed, bull-necked creature, halfway between hy hyena and dingo. There were maggots squirming in its mangy fur, and it began to walk steps. The black cat leaped upon it, and in seconds they were a rolling, writhing thing, moving faster than my eyes could follow, all this in silence. And then a low roar, down the country road at the bottom of our drive, in the distance, a lumbering late-night truck, its blazing headlights burned bright as green suns through my binoculars. I lowered them from my eyes and saw only darkness and the gentle yellow of headlights and then the red of the rear lights as it vanished off again into nowhere at all. When I raised the binoculars once more, there was nothing to be seen, only the black cat on the steps, staring up into the air. I trained the binoculars up and saw something flying away, a vulture perhaps, or an eagle, and then it flew beyond the trees and was gone. I went out onto the porch and picked up the black cat and stroked him and said kind, soothing things to him. He meowed piteously when I first approached him, but after a while, he went to sleep in my lap, and I put him into his basket and went upstairs to my bed to sleep myself. There was dried blood on my t-shirt and jeans the following morning. That was a week ago. The thing that comes to my house does not come every night, but it comes most nights. We know it by the wounds on the cat, and the pain I can see in those lionine eyes. He has lost the use of his front left paw, and his right eye is closed for good. I wonder what we did to deserve the black cat. I wonder who sent him. And selfish and scared, I wonder how much more he has to give. That was The Price by Neil Gaiman. I hope you enjoyed this reading, and if you did, let me know so I can do more. Have a good day.